So back when I was very young, uh, about 14 or 15, I encountered some self-help books in the field of psychology, which really inspired me to go on and pursue psychology as a discipline, as something that I wanted to do as a career. So I went on to become a psychologist and I got hired as a developmental psychologist at Eastern Washington University in 1996. But there was something that was kind of missing from this whole picture of what it takes to be the happiest person possible, which is really what I see to be a goal of both a behavioral approach to, to learning and a cognitive approach. Um, because when we help people as psychologists through those different methods, we're looking at the way we can arrange things in people's worlds to be the happiest they can possibly be. What you're talking about changing the environment in somebody's um, an environment in somebody's world or you're talking about directly changing their behavior or changing their attitude. You're always looking at the best way to for them to be happy. But I was one of these struggling tenure track professors and I was thinking there's there's something that's not really connected for me. And in 1998 I actually encountered some books and this video uh, that was called Affluenza. And the books that I encountered were in this area called Voluntary Simplicity. In, in fact, I read this book by Dwayne Elgin uh, that was about voluntary simplicity. And the objective of that movement, I learned, was to live simply so that other people could simply live. Or to find at once the maximum benefit for the environment, for the world itself, for all people. And at the same time, finding the maximum benefit for oneself. The maximum well-being for the entire world and the maximum well-being for oneself. But where voluntary simplicity comes in is it says that if you didn't have to worry so much about your finances, about working every day, about competing with the Joneses or you know uh, finding more and more income, if you didn't have to worry so much about that, then you could free up your time to do more of the things that you really enjoy in life, such as music or uh, some other hobby that you really enjoy. At the same time, if you're not earning all of this extra money, you're not probably spending as much. You're not consuming as much from the planet. And that's where I learned that uh, that America, even though it makes up only 5% of the entire population of the world, consumes some 25 to 30% of its resources. So it obviously isn't a formula for sustainability. But if we could all live more simply, so that we could both free up more time to do the things that are truly meaningful to us, spending more time with the people that we love, spending more time doing the things that we really truly enjoy that actually inspire us to be creative and at the same time living more simply so that the environment is more sustainable and so that other people in other countries and developing nations can have more of the kinds of things that we have that to me completed the picture and so I took what I had learned in psychology the internal kinds of approaches, the very personal approach of changing my behavior and changing my thoughts to arrive at the maximum happiness. But then this movement came along and said, there's something more to it. You know, you could change your behavior but still have the same kind of work. You know, what about your life as the big picture? What about and the effect that you're having on everybody else in the world? So that movement itself completed the picture for me. But it took many years after that for me to then say, well, how do I do research in this area? There's plenty of research that I can do in the fields of cognitive psychology and behavioral psychology. But there wasn't anything really academic truly established in this movement of voluntary simplicity, at least not in my area, back in 1998. And then in 1999, uh, the president of the American Psychological Association, Martin Seligman, along with a colleague of his, Sixent Mihaly, wrote this article in The American Psychologist, which was about positive psychology. And that article 
actually took all that was valuable about a former movement in psychology called the humanistic psychology movement, Carl Rogers, uh, Abram Maslow. But it said, you know, all of that emphasis on human potential and everything that's positive about human being, being a human being, and everything we can do in psychology about making life more positive, if we make that a scientific effort in the field of psychology, then we will arrive at something truly, truly inspiring and truly helpful. So, many years after that, I actually then figured out a way to take my research in my area and couple it with this movement. And the way I found out how to do that was through the research that had then evolved out of this, this movement, the happiness movement is what it came to be called and to actually then couple my field of developmental psychology with this science of happiness that had evolved by you know, eight or nine years ago. So now I find myself in this perfect situation to be utilizing the kinds of surveys that we're doing through the Happiness Alliance and that are being done, done worldwide and coupling that research, those surveys, with other kinds of surveys and instruments that are done in my field that focus on a more intrapersonal kind of perspective. I see great potential for this because by utilizing the survey and then finding other instruments that are used in my own discipline, we can look at the relationship between people's ratings of, for example, community support and uh, the kinds of cultural opportunities that are available in their communities and reports of how socially well-off people feel in different stages of the life course or how uh, resilient people feel. And so I find that this combination of the Happiness Alliance survey along with my field um, provides a really nice kind of ecological and environmental perspective and approach to understanding well-being coupled with my approach in my field which is much more of an intrapersonal or meaning within the individual kind of approach. That combination of the environmental ecological with many measures of well-being in the field of psychology that are much more internally focused really helps create a more clear and complete picture of how we all can be the happiest that we can be. Mm -hmm.